All right, now we're ready for our final exploration of the bubonic plague and its impact on medieval society and then on even modern society going forward. So we'll begin with a discussion of it's the wrong slide. There we go. Of the reaction of the medical community to the plague and take a look at the effectiveness of the medical community in dealing with the plague. Um, in the process of studying that, we'll have the opportunity to go back and look at some ancient medical practices which continued well into the time of the bubonic plague. We'll look at a second societal structure, namely the church, and how it dealt with the plague among parishioners and the impact that it had on medieval society. And we'll look also at a movement, religious movement, taking place during the time of the plague known as the flagellants uh, as a reaction to the ineffectiveness of the clergy in dealing with the impact of the plague. And finally, we'll look at the overall impact of the bubonic plague, the Black Death, on the reigning governmental system at the time, the feudal system, and ask the question, did the bubonic plague in its aftermath spur the development of the flowering of intellectual thought in the period of time known as the Renaissance? So, if we go back to a consideration of medicine during the time of the plague, it's perhaps useful to note that during the Middle Ages, time, time moved slowly. But with the coming of the, the pestilence, the Black Death, change began to take place on an accelerated scale. Depending on whose numbers you like, whose numbers were correct, somewhere between a quarter and a half of the population of Europe disappeared in a three-year period. And I think it takes very little imagination to consider what the consequences of such a thing if it were to happen today. The wheels that grind to make po life possible, the institutions, the people who run them, would be very hard-pressed to keep things going. And during the Black Death, when the ability of people to communicate was considerably lower than it is today, and the ability to assess and understand the causes of the pageant of death that was playing out before their eyes was likewise impoverished, all of this would simply make the whole thing unfathomable and the capacity to deal with the devastation that much harder. It does, however, teach much about human psychology and the durability of the human spirit. So our task in this, this module is to examine three societal institutions, namely medicine, religion, and government, to see how they reacted to the plague and how helpful those institutions were to people during the time of the plague which factors limited their effectiveness, and how all of this changed people's understanding of and response to the plague. So we'll begin with an examination of the medical community. It's difficult and certainly uncharitable to deride medieval physicians for their inability to enact effective responses to the bubonic plague in the 14th century, because after all, they were products of their time. Their understanding of the cause of disease was firmly lodged in an earlier time, an earlier millennium, in fact, for roughly 2,000 years. Uh, that's how long ago their understanding of disease, how it worked, how it was communicated, uh, was, was rooted. So their ability, the ability of the physicians to stem the spread of the plague was severely limited by their ancient understanding of how disease occurred. And the fact that the conditions that prevailed in medieval homes, as we've already noted, severely exacerbated the spread of the plague. But nonetheless, it's instructive to examine the factors that were in play during the time of the plague so that we can understand 
in part, people's reaction to the disease. So one of the things that medieval physicians did in order to, to help people understand what was going on around them and maybe give them some form of hope was that they issued these things called tractates. They were simply little pamphlets that described the prevailing medical thought at the time, and they had some helpful suggestions for how people could deal with the ongoing plague. The tractates had three main goals. One was to address the cause of the plague as they understood it, at least at that time, mm -hmm. prescribe different kinds of treatments, and also regimens they felt would prevent normal people from getting the plague. So what were the kinds of advice specifically given to people during the time of the plague? Well, the first of these was the idea that you should flee wicked heirs, the title of the, the first lecture I gave on the plague. And that idea descended from the notion that the plague was caused by a miasma. And so you were well advised to flee those wicked heirs, flee those, those miasmas that, that contain bad elements that could cause disease. And probably that was useful in certain senses, but but not in the sense that we would understand today. The second notion that was communicated in the tractates was that you should keep your humors well disposed by embracing cheerfulness. Yes, nothing defeats the plague like remaining humorous and cheerful during the devastation. So I'm sure you can imagine how well and how effective that was. Another sage piece of advice, uh, one that we'll revisit later in this presentation, is that you should avoid bad women. Also, refrain from gluttony, one of the sadly, seven deadly sins, and naturally, uh, getting drunk was not authorized as a good idea during the time of the plague. When possible, and certainly this would be possible for people who are well healed and had a lot of money, you should spend your leisure time in gardens with fragrant plants and vines, preferably while singing and dancing, or perhaps engaging in conversation. Now, this is not as vacuous as it seems, in that during the time of the plague, um, there were a number of people who had expertise in herbs as a mechanism for controlling and treating disease, and so spending your leisure time in gardens was probably um, given to, to encourage people to be around plants that might have activity in preventing and treating the plague. But as you can imagine, while these ideas were well meant, they were largely ineffective. So much of the difficulty with the plague is that no one, and that includes physicians, understood what caused the plague. The germ theory of disease was still centuries away. There was no understanding that invisible agents that we now call germs or pathogens could not only be passed from person to person, but from rats and fleas to people, and in some cases, as you already know, uh, through the air, in the case of the pneumonic plague. As a result of this lack of understanding, there was no attempt to control rats or fleas, thus basically assuring that all of the elements of the plague and its transmission would be unfettered in their ability to come together and transmit plague. And, of course, this was exacerbated by the reality that in medieval times, the disposal of bodies was fairly crude, and if you have bodies riddled with plague sitting around, uh, it's that much easier to communicate it one to another. There was a general understanding that it was unhygienic to leave bodies lying around because, after all, they smell bad. And to the extent that miasmas were connected to, to air that smells bad, uh, they would have had some notion that having dead bodies laying around was not a good idea. And, as previously discussed, the burial of the dead was the usual practice but the handling of those dead bodies was crude, as was the interaction of caretakers with the sick and the dying. Washing one, one's hands had not yet become an acceptable or an accepted practice 
following the treatment of sick patients, and it wasn't until the time of Louis Pasteur in the 19th century that this became a standard practice. Physicians themselves were fairly efficient in spreading disease between patients because they did not wash their hands as a matter of course between patients. Particularly in the case of caring for somebody who was sick with the pneumonic plague, there would have been very little protection of the caretakers from the bloody sputum that comes forth from somebody having the pneumonic plague and which can infect other humans without the intervention of fleas. Finally, medieval houses and cities would have been littered with debris that supported the breeding of rats and fleas, thereby increasing the likelihood that the biological players in plague transmission would have all been present. As time went on and more people died, the ability to carry out any hygienic practices and disposal of bodies and keep the streets clean and also exercise caution in the care of the sick would all diminish, and with it, the spread of the plague would increase. But despite their impoverishment, medieval physicians did get one thing right when judged by modern standards, and that was to develop a protective suit, which was to be donned by the physician while attending patients. And here you see a picture of the standard physician's protective suit during the time of the plague. The the costume made the physician look more like a crazed bird than a helpful friend, but the head mask did perhaps have some function in retarding the spread of the disease from the sick patient to the doctor. The mask that he's wearing features a filter as part of that mask that kind of looks like a beak, hence the crazed bird reference. And the mask had the ability to to filter out things in the air. In the the mind of the physician, uh, it was filtering out and preventing the miasma from getting into the physician. But we now know that what was really happening and and the extent to which it was effective uh, was made so by the fact that it may have prevented plague bacteria from getting into the physician's airways. Uh, In addition, the mask was fitted with goggles that covered the physician's eyes and were thought to protect him from the haze, which is, again, probably a reference to a miasma. So at least that was something that, that they could use and everybody felt a little bit better about in the time of the plague. Perhaps the most interesting and remarkable thing about medicine and medical practice during the time of the bubonic plague, with one notable exception having to do with um, the, the Pope's personal physician, was that it did not stir physicians to explore and investigate new solutions to treating the disease or preventing it. In fact, there is a fairly direct lineage of descent of medical thought that arose during the time of Galen in the first century. Uh, Galen was a very famous ancient physician, and his notions had become fairly well established and the firmament of medical thought. But the interesting thing is that the Galenic traditions lived on into the time of the Black Death, which took place 1,200 years later, and in fact um, continued to be very influential up until about the 18th or 19th century. So the medicines that were available to, to treat specific conditions, such as the plague, did not evolve much during the time period from Galen in the first or, or second century. It's not clear exactly what his, his dates are until we get to the 19th century. So during the time of the plague, people were still using and following the Galenic properties and traditions to treat and understand disease. Now, one of the treatments developed during the time of Galen, which continued to be used throughout the the 14th century and into the 19th century, was a medicine called theriac, 
also referred to as the universal antidote, which we'll talk about uh, quite a bit in a few minutes. Um, If we consider in a little more depth the nature of the Galenic principles that guided thought during the time of the, the plague, we note that part of the reason why Galen was was so influential is that he had a rich and varied history. He, for instance, served as a physician to the gladiator school during his time on earth, and that gave him abundant opportunity to examine and treat trauma victims, from which he learned a lot about human anatomy and physiology. In fact, he frequently gave public lectures on the subject and also demonstrations to the public. As a result of all this, he won renown among the upper crust by correctly treating complicated conditions, which made him very well known to royal patrons who supported him throughout his life. And this netted Galen a position as the personal physician to Marcus Aurelius, an emperor, and several other emperors thereafter. And while often hailed as modern, especially for his irrational approach to medicine and disease, Galen also shows abundant evidence of primitive thinking, too. For instance, he was a big fan of bloodletting for curing various conditions. And the idea behind bloodletting was simply to purge unhealthy influences in the blood. Because he, Galen, like his contemporaries and those who followed him, believed that health and disease was an issue of balancing the body's humors. So, one of the things that happened when you got sick was that you would have your veins cut open and you would be allowed to bleed for a certain amount of time because... The humors that are found in the body, there are four humors, uh, were out of balance. And the way to rebalance them was to let you bleed for a while. Here you see some lucky guy getting blood, and that would restore the balance of the body's humor in some unknown way. Now, at the time of Galen, and for almost 2,000 years thereafter, it was believed that there were four humors, and they were blood bile, yellow bile, and phlegm. And each of these had specific properties, which were hot, cold, wet, and dry, respectively. Disease occurred if those bal- those humors were not properly balanced. Furthermore, disease could be prevented by following a regimen that was directed at maintaining a proper balance. So in Galen's view, it was the physician's job to prescribe and adjust the regimen for maintaining a good balance, which is known in Latin as the Regimen Sanitatis. And that was done in order to keep the patient happy and healthy. Now, during Galen's time, and and certainly for uh, many hundreds of years thereafter, there was an ongoing belief in the power of plants to cure various maladies. They believed that certain plants contained elements that would prevent or treat disease, and that the plants themselves showed signs of what the plant was good for treating. We'll look at this in more detail in a subsequent module, but let's take the classical example of the liverwort, which is a very primitive plant, and it's called liverwort because if you look at it in the right light, and I have to confess it doesn't really look this way to me, but to the ancients it it did. If you look at the liverwort, it bears, at least to the ancient mind, a resemblance to the human liver in the human body and was therefore prescribed for treating liver conditions or ailments like jaundice. So that's one example. There are other common herbs or plant-derived treatments from plants, um, Things like camphor, rose, pomegranate were all considered to be medicinally valuable and were harvested and used to treat a variety of different diseases. 
And all of these were used during the time of the plague to treat humans for some reason. But the most common plague preventative and also therapeutic drug was a mixture of substances that goes under the name of theriac. There were lots of recipes for theriac, which translated from the Arabic, that is to say the recipes were translated from the Arabic, uh, might contain as many as 80 different ingredients. Most of the ingredients were plant-based chemicals, but some of the recipes also included some exotic things like viper skin, because it was thought to counteract the poison in a snake bite if the viper skin was fed to the patient in graduated doses. Other ingredients in theriac included things like ground coral, balsam, pepper, rose, water, sage, cinnamon, saffron, ginger, parsley, myrrh, and here it is, wait for it, several ounces of opium, which undoubtedly was responsible for whatever valuable properties that theriac might have had. But as it was called the universal antidote, theriac was used to treat all manner of conditions up to and including the plague, but certainly not limited to the plague. Again, in retrospect, the most important effects contributed by theriac were undoubtedly the result of the opium that was in the mixture. So, one can legitimately ask whether or not the fantastic claims about theriac being made during the time of the plague were true. Um, We can note that, irrespective of whether it was true, the idea that theriac could treat anything and be good for any bad condition persisted for about 2,000 years. So it really doesn't matter whether from a modern perspective it worked. People thought it did and therefore used it. But from a modern perspective, it's useful to ask, could theriac prevent one from getting the plague? One of the major uses. Well, realistically, and given what we know from modern medicine, theriac could not have prevented a person from getting the plague. However, there were ingredients in theriac that could have helped promote good health, and to the extent that a strong constitution would make it less likely that you'd get the plague, there may have been a small positive effect on prevention that provided was provided by theriac. It would be the sort of effect that kept you safe until you could get out of town, for instance, and away from the pathogen. In other words, theriac would probably not get you through the plague epidemic all by itself. But one shouldn't overlook the potential placebo effect provided by theriac. People tend to be more vulnerable when they view a situation as hopeless and that they're unable to do anything to alter what appears to be a set course of action. So the administration of theriac at least gave people a psychological boost and a reason to believe that their personal fate might be different. There were even medical tracks that identified specific specific body types for which theriac was likely to be most useful in preventing the plague and also directions for administration, such as take two to three times per week, if not daily, with a meal according to your physician friends. So, Let's assume that a person has already contracted the plague. Could theriac be helpful to that person? For medieval physicians, the answer was unequivocally yes. In fact, theriac was described by medieval physicians as being unsurpassed in its effectiveness, suggesting that the bar was probably pretty low. (laughs) Because a lot of people were dying of the plague all around them. But from other times and other diseases, it was believed that theriac was effective in treating conditions as diverse as nausea, thirst, headache, fever, pain, weakness, and anxiety, which were all conditions that were reported by people stricken with the plague. Of the various effects that were reported with the plague, again, it's highly likely that opium was the ingredient that would have lessened 
many of the symptoms, uh, for instance, things such as pain, coughing, and diarrhea can be positively impacted by opium. In addition, opium has a sedative effect that would have been very helpful in getting rest during the ravages of the plague. Some cautions in the use of use of theriac were also offered by those wonderful medieval physicians. Um, for instance, it was recommended that theriac not be applied directly to the buboes. Here the fear was that the theriac might push the the poisons in the buboes further into the body and cause additional difficulties. But the big question remains whether or not theriac was useful during the time of the plague or whether it was all just wishful thinking that from a modern perspective would, would not be justified. So is there any evidence that theriac would have been effective during the time of the plague? And again, the answer is a qualified yes. And this is borne out by a recent paper, a recent study, the main table from which appears in this slide. What these folks did was to take a variety of, of substances, one of which was theriac itself containing opium, as you know, and compared it to some single uh, extracts of plants, including absinthe, camphor, pomegranate, and rose. They looked at a variety of symptomologies, fever, pain, cough, diarrhea, vomiting, dys dyspnea, it's a um, breathing problem, abscesses, boils and ulcers, and just general health. And what they did was uh, watch people being treated, or they also looked uh, for evidence in, in medical journals of treatment for these conditions with these different chemicals. And they then rated the effectiveness using a plus system. Oops. The more pluses that appear, the more effective it was. So one plus is moderately effective, but two pluses is slightly more effective, and three pluses is really effective. It was a good stuff. Sorry about that. Keep switching on me. So what you see from this is that some of the individual plant chemicals were semi-effective. They, they sort of did something for, for various of these different maladies. Uh, camphor a little bit more effective than the others, having two pluses in its column. But compared to everything else, theriac was highly effective because it has three pluses in a couple of columns and two in others. So uh, theriac does appear to have legitimate biological activity that can be useful during the time of the plague. So this is a paper published by the author Brill in 2013 and gives us our most comprehensive technical data supporting the general ability of theriac, largely through its opium constituent, to do things useful in treating the plague. Basically, it manages symptoms, but you know, you take what you can get. All right, so that's a synopsis of what was going on in medicine. What about religion? As you know, God was a focal point of medieval life. God was not confined to Sunday, but was an everyday concern. So it's perhaps understandable that appeals to God would be made to escape the plague, or for relief, for relief for those who had contracted it. God was viewed also, and interestingly, as the likely source of plague and as a punishment for wickedness. So the, the deity was on both sides of the ledger as the preventative agent and also the person who brought the plague to make a point about human sin. The reaction to the plague among the clergy was perhaps less noble than one would hope for, or for among those who are doing uh, God's work here on earth. It's certainly true that many clergy willingly attended the sick and the dying, and as a result of their closeness to sick people, themselves became ill with the plague. 
there's an interesting interlude vignette here because the Pope, which we normally associate uh, with having a residence in Rome, um, was not in Rome. The Pope, in fact, moved his residence to Avignon in France uh, and was in residence there. Uh, we know that the the, parish, the the priests who attended the Pope's residency in Avignon uh, were pretty dedicated to the people because the number of priests in residence fell from 40 prior to the plague to 7 after the plague by the time it left Europe. Still, as the plague claimed more and more victims, some clergy began to shun their du- duties for fear of contracting the scourge. In addition to refusing to render last rites to sick people, some priests even went so far as to refuse to hear confessions. As a substitute, they suggested that men confess to one another, which was pretty much unheard of. And if that wasn't possible, and this is how desperate things became, uh, they, the men, could take the unprecedented step of allowing a woman, oh my God, to hear one's confession, but only as a last Resort. Uh, From the pulpit across the land, one heard that the plague was God's expression of displeasure with bad behavior of men on earth. And the message was reinforced with more helpful track dates that argued that the plague was a rational reaction of the deity to sinful behavior by mankind. To rid the world of the plague, one needed to purge sin of all kinds. And a lot of the on-duty pastors cited Deuteronomy 28 to make the case that that God promises prosperity to those who keep the faith and plague to those who do not. I'll read from it briefly. Uh, It says, If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commandments I give you today, the Lord your God will set you on high above all nations on earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. There follows, then, a long list of blessings, after which it says, However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commandments and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. The Lord will plague you with diseases until he has destroyed you from the land and you are entering to possess. The Lord will strike you with wasting disease, with fever and inflammation, with scorching heat and drought. So this was thought to be a reference to the plague, one of the several things that God would send to destroy you if you were sinful. So, the passage from Deuteronomy, again, is something that was used repeatedly by the clergy to point out that uh, God is watching. You should not do bad things. If you do bad things, you could get the plague. Uh, And others made the argument more generally, society itself caused plague by sinful behavior, and plague was a cure for fragmentation and social problems. So be grateful, which seems like a stretch, but, you know, desperate times require desperate measures. Some people, some preachers, argued that the plague was evidence that the end of time was near, and it wasn't a particularly difficult argument to make, because after all, medieval people believed and expected Christ would return, and that his return would be heralded by the appearance of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which were, in order, famine, pestilence, war, and death. With the plague, you get all four. So there was not much evidence required to believe that the plague had come and was sent by God to usher in the end of the world. Uh, One of the things that took place during the time of the plague was that there was a huge increase in enrollment in Christian churches as a result of the fact that people understood as a a society that, that plague was retribution for sinful behavior. So, as the death toll mounted, the 
medieval population became increasingly unsettled. Prayers were not stopping the plague. The clergy themselves were viewed as ineffective in their ministrations. And the church hierarchy also came under increasing criticism. This was fueled by misbehavior that began at the top. Pope Clement VI was disliked for having retained the papal residence at Avignon in preference to the traditional location in Rome. But even more egregious were the allegations of abuse of power and misappropriation of funds. The Pope surrounded himself with opulence even as his parishioners were dying in droves in squalor. Priests were also increasingly held in low esteem as well because they suffered from allegations of having and harboring concubines and engaging in the very kinds of behavior they expected others to forego. Also, there was that callous refusal to administer death rites, which did not help. So, in part, these reactions were foreseeable. The tide of death that beset society was unstoppable, or seemingly unstoppable, Even the royal family in England was affected. King Edward III retreated to his country estate along with his eldest son to wait out the plague. But his favorite daughter, Joan of England, was taken by the plague en route to marry a Spanish prince. The gentry uh, left cities in droves to escape the plague, but the peasants who tended their, their country estates continued to die in large numbers, as did the poor who had to remain in in the cities for lack of better better options. By 1349, so many people were dying that grave diggers needed to produce 300 graves a day to keep up with the body count in London alone. At Avignon, where the Pope was ensconced, 11,000 people, 11,000 people died in a six-week period and there simply were not enough grave grave diggers to keep up with the body count. So in desperation, the Pope literally consecrated the Rhone River and had the bodies thrown into the river and buried in a watery grave because the grave diggers who were living in wretched conditions and were most likely to contract the plague simply could not keep up. In Italy, mass graves were filled with as many bodies as they could accommodate. The bodies were laid in trenches, as they say, lasagna style, meaning that the rows of bodies would be be placed with the heads at one end, all pointing in one direction, and the next layer of bodies would, would be placed in the opposite direction with their feet at the end. So the horror was, was intense and was chronicled by various people writing at the time. One of them was a guy named Agnolo di Turo, whose entire family died of plague. And one of the things he said was, quote, they died by the hundreds both day and night, and all were thrown in ditches covered with a little earth. And as soon as those ditches were filled, more were dug. And I, Agnolo di Turo, buried my five children with my own hands, And so many died that all believed it was the end of the world. So at this point, society itself was unraveling. Having lost faith in the clergy, people turned to other solutions. One was conveniently provided by a group that began its odyssey in Germany. From the Rhine region of Germany came a group called the flagellants. They were groups of men who believed extraordinary penance was required to assuage God's anger at human sin. And their solution was to try to replicate the suffering of Christ's passion and, as a result, to expiate the sin which God had delivered to the world in the form of the plague. So hoping to win God's mercy by purging sin, Groups of up to a thousand men walking two by two and chanting the Pater Noster, which is Latin for the Lord's Prayer, and also Ave Maria, traveled the countryside. They had a fairly complicated structure which involved committing themselves to a master who led the procession with a banner made of purple velvet. 
And then they would wander into a town and have a ceremony which involved having each of the flagellants stripped to the waist and beat himself with a leather-tipped thong, trying to outdo the others by inflicting the most damage on himself. Meanwhile, the master would circulate and add extra beatings to any member who had dared transgress the group's rules or who had committed a crime. This would be repeated three times a day for 33 and a third days, which corresponded to the number of Christ's years on earth. And then in the end, the master would call for mercy to all sinners, including members of the audience who had come to see the flagellants. Now, the flagellants had a, a fairly rigorous structure. It was a movement, after all, based on piety. Its members went through a rigorous selection process that ensured their commitment to the cause. For instance, new members had to confess all of their sins since the age of seven, and then candidates for membership in the flagellants had to beat themselves for 33 days. Additionally, each member had to take a vow of extreme poverty. They had to agree never to bathe, shave, change clothes, or so much as speak to women. But considering how badly they must have smelled, uh, the latter should not have been much of a problem. Finally, after all of that, members were charged a fee to join this group or you beat yourself. As a result, the flagellants were not a group that was open to poor people, and they could populate uh, the, the group with the more desirable types, with good clothes and an income of some sort. Now, it's, it was something that got started with perhaps good intentions, but as we will see, it ended poorly uh, because the flagellants, like so many groups that start with modest, humble roots, um, they, they sort of became rock stars of medieval times and began to believe their own press, I guess is the long and the short of it. How did this come about? Well, it came about because of excess. People in towns who saw the flagellants were drawn to their zealotry. Uh, standard religion was delivering nothing in terms of protecting people from the population, so a more rigorous form of devotion was required to encourage God to, to take the plague from mankind. People became enthralled just watching the procession and the, the ceremony that took pl- place at the center of the town. For the first time, regular people felt as, they, as if they could do something to protect themselves. And in fact, many of the people who were watching the flagellants beat themselves would then take the the blood that the the flagellants were dripping all over the place because of the the metal studs that were in their their whips. And they would smear themselves with the, the blood of the flagellants as it dripped from their wounded bodies. Some believed it had miraculous properties. But all were uplifted by the presence of the flagellants who seemed to have hit upon a brutal but effective way to appease God. And people desperately wanted and psychologically required some sort of miracle. The flagellants appeared to have provided one. People in towns actually began to internalize the message that the flagellants brought and as this took hold, the, the people, not the flagellants, but the people in medieval towns tried to actively purge sin among the inhabitants and enforce and implement the reforms that the flagellants promoted. So citizens groups were formed to monitor and roust sinners. Gambling and prostitution became actionable offenses. Even swearing could land you in jail. Townspeople even prescribed a series of ordinances that regulated the treatment of the dead. One very curious one even called for the cessation 
of ringing the funeral bell, as was the, the custom when people died. They would ring a, a bell as the, and that the bell would toll as the person was taken to the graveyard to be buried. But there was so much ringing of the funeral bell that it was viewed as creating an unnecessary source of worry and angst. And so they, they created an actual law to prevent it from being rung. Now, in the end, the flagellants made three critical mistakes that ultimately led to the demise of the movement. First, encouraged by the reaction of the peasants to the movement, the flagellants began to claim that they had the power to to forgive sins. And this, of course, would be a direct affront to the Catholic Church, which believed that only Jesus can forgive sins and that the Church was empowered to do so on earth as Christ's representative. It was an affront that the Pope could not overlook as it directly threatened to usurp his power. Connected with this, the flagellants, as I said, began to believe their own press and claimed to be able to perform miracles. It was claimed, for instance, that a dead baby was revived by the flagellants and that under the flagellants, Um, it's silly to say this, but under their direction, a cow was, was heard to talk. So they say. But, as you may know, miracles were, were thought to be the exclusive province of the church. And these claims of miracles being enacted by mere mortals could not be overlooked by the Pope. Another action that that proved extremely problematic for the flagellants was that they believed that in God's eyes, the most offensive humans on the planet were the Jews for having crucified Christ. Following this logic, the flagellants decided that God's favor could be restored by exterminating the Jews. Under their guidance and encouragement, the Jews in Germany, which you recall is where the, the flagellants came from, the Jews were rounded up and accused of a variety of offenses, such as the fouling of water supplies with poisons that resulted in the plague. And of course, once they rounded up, they were subsequently tortured. And as so often the case, people who are tortured will confess to crimes they did not commit. In medieval times, the penalty for these kinds of charges was death. Similar, quote-unquote, confessions were extracted from Jews in many German cities, which begat a wholesale slaughter of people of the Jewish faith. Pope Clement even pointed out that Jews were dying of the plague in numbers equal to non-Jews, so they could not be the source of the plague. But hysterical people are notoriously immune to logic, and that proclamation had no effect. So, in 1349, an event known as the St. Valentine's Massacre took place in which 2,000 Jews were killed over the course of the year. They were taken into custody and they were burned alive. And sadly, this was repeated in 15 other cities in Germany and Switzerland So by the time the plague left Europe, the number of Jews had diminished significantly. And of course, as I mentioned, they were burned alive, which is a really, truly horrific way to be dispatched. But the human need to assign causation to events is so great that people all over Europe, not merely in Germany and Switzerland, were looking for a reason that the plague had come. Sometimes prostitutes or women with loose morals were blamed. Um, Some were accused of being witches, for which, again, the the death penalty would be enacted. The idea that witchcraft was alive and well in the 14th century was evident and was even a topic that attracted the attention of Pope John XII, who was the second pope ensconced at Avignon and the author of a book entitled 
Magic and the Inquisition, a real page turner, which was published in 1326 prior to the plague. But there was a later publication entitled Malleus Maleficarum, which literally translates as the Witch Hammer, and published in the 15th century, and made explicit the connection between witches and women. So we are advised in Malleus Maleficarum, for instance, that, I love this, quote, when a woman is alone, she thinks evil, unquote. Also found in Malleus Maleficarum were assertions that women were, quote, a foe to friendship, an inescapable punishment, and a necessary evil, unquote. So to think that women were capable of pure evil was not a particularly big leap, and to associate them with the the significant evil known as the plague that was causing so much devastation would likewise be a fairly convenient way to excuse uh, its presence on Earth. Another perennial favorite among scapegoats, it turns out, are cats. For what reason, I do not know. But a great number of cats were dispatched by humans for the crime of bringing plague to mankind during the time of the Black Death. Now, back to the flagellants. Although the group was started by true believers, all that changed with the time, the, te- the attention, and the approbation that the flagellants began to receive from the people in towns that, that needed the psychological release that they brought. But the final thing that led to the end of the flagellant movement is that they began to show signs of arrogance. People hailed them as great redeemers, and the flagellants internalized that as being true. They became convinced that they were invincible and also entitled to what? To money, to wine, to women. So it started out as a pious movement filled with zealots, evolved into a group of drunken louts who displayed exactly the kind of behavior that the flagellants were designed to extinguish. Finally, in October of 1349, Pope Clement ordered the flagellants to disperse. The command was ignored until a militia was sent to round up the flagellants, and the beheading of several flagellant masters was enough to convince the rest of the flagellants to cease and desist. So by 1350, the purgers had themselves been purged. But unfortunately, for the long-suffering medieval peasant, the demise of the flagellants was also the end of one of the few sources of relief that they had. The arrival of the flagellants to a town was a source of celebration. The people who gathered to see the flagellants could work off their fear, their grief, and their surplus emotion in a collective fashion. In response, the people confessed sin. They atoned for wrongs. They they sought forgiveness. The flagellants had brought some blessed relief from the fear that pervaded every waking moment. And once they disbanded, the old world of fear returned. Now, one interesting thing is you may think that as a result of all that was happening, of the rampant death, of the ineffectiveness of the clergy and of the medical community to make any difference, you might have thought, that as a society, people would have collectively turned away from religion, from God. What kind of God is it who inflicts this kind of suffering on his people and provides nothing in the way of a cure? But in fact, during the time and after the time of the Great Plague, the survivors were very busy building these amazing 14th century cathedrals, two of which you see here. Some of the most beautiful monuments to God ever constructed. And so it's pretty clear that mankind during the time of the plague did not turn away from God, but embraced him wholeheartedly and continued to live as if their lives depended on the intercession of 
a merciful God. Well, to understand the impact of the Black Death on medieval society, I think it's necessary to contemplate the effect of massive, unexpected death on a global scale. As people became ill, they could no longer work. This meant that activities that required human labor would come to a standstill. Agriculture is a critical enterprise that requires a huge ongoing investment of human labor. With the plague, much of that activity would have come to a stop once it could no longer be outsourced to those who weren't sick. So imagine what that would have meant. Crops would stand in the field since workers to harvest the crop were likely suffering from one of three fates. One, they were sick from the plague. Two, they had died of the plague. Or three, they were afraid afraid of contracting the plague and had gone into hiding. If the crops weren't harvested, the food available to feed the survivors would plummet, as would income from the sale of the harvest. Either way, economic chaos would result. Livestock such as swine, cattle, and sheep must be fed, either by turning them out to pasture or by providing stored food every day. As the labor force diminished, livestock were probably let go to forage for themselves. The solution would also have made cleaning up after the animals in the barn or in the paddock unnecessary, and that would have saved some time and effort. But it was a symptom of society on the verge of collapse. To a certain extent, creative redirection of energies could assist in in keeping society going. Instead of growing livestock, which require daily care and maintenance, property people could switch to growing a cash crop, which requires less in the way of ongoing effort. The switch would have assisted, or excuse me, what was assisted, by the economic reality that in times of shortage, the prices paid for goods that were in short supply would likely go up. Indeed, the price of food increased roughly fourfold as the plague swept across Europe. While this was good for the gentry, it exacerbated the dire conditions of the peasants who could not afford to pay the highly inflated prices. Agriculture, of course, was not the only industry affected by the plague. Everything was. So the ripples that perhaps began in agriculture spread and magnified as time and the plague went on. Entire towns had been depopulated by the plague, either because the inhabitants died or because they fled. Many churches were standing empty, both of priests and parishioners. From the dressmaker to the baker to the herbalist, everybody's ability to ply their trades, to make money, to feed themselves, was imperiled. And because of the suddenness with which the the plague struck, the comprehensiveness of the death it caused, and the ability of the plague to travel rapidly via overland, as well as via water routes, it is no wonder that to the average peasant this truly conveyed the notion of the end of the world. This is not to say that valiant attempts to hold society gather, together were not undertaken, but due to the lack of understanding of the nature of the disease and rigid ideas about social class and changes made had little ability to address the problems brought by the plague. Prior to the advent of the plague, the labor of peasants was a cheap commodity. There were lots of peasants, and therefore their labor could be procured for a very low price. Under the feudal system of government, grants of land were given in return for labor. Of course, the class structure in medieval society insisted on a differential allocation of resources according to one's rank. The king gave grants of land to noblemen, who were primarily bishops and barons, of high rank in exchange for a pledge of allegiance, an agreement to ally themselves with the king in political disputes, and to help the king field an army in times of war. 
The noblemen then further subdivided the land among their vassals, which is a fancy word for servant, but uh, people who were noblemen of lower ranks, as well as knights. But so far, we don't have a labor force. The labor was provided by those peasants who were allowed to live on the land held by the noblemen in exchange for their labor, a tiny bit of land, and no vassals, because the peasants were the laborers. And they were the ones whose work kept the rest of the food chain going. Prior to the plague, peasant labor was abundant and therefore cheap. After the plague, there were many fewer peasants, as the plague had an exaggerated effect on the, ple- the peasant ca- class, and the value of peasant labor soared somewhere between 20 to 40 percent, depending on whose number you believe, which sounds like a win for the peasants. But Parliament started passing laws to prevent those peasants from getting uppity, one of which was the Statute of Laborers, passed in 1351, which prevented peasants from seeking higher wages. In addition, prior to the plague, the government raised money by levying taxes on communities. After the plague, the need for money increased, and this changed to levying taxes on individuals, which had the capacity to bring in more money. A third factor that was was that due to the exodus and death of many noblemen during the time of the plague, their estates lay empty. Those of lower rank began to take over the empty estates as a result. It seemed to those traditionally in charge that things were therefore getting out of hand. So to combat the perceived chaos, the so-called sumptuary laws were passed in 1362, which were an attempt to put the peasants back in their rightful place. The new law prescribed the diet of the average peasant and required that clothes be worn of the appropriate quality and a specific color to visually convey the rank of the person wearing them. The noblemen were desperate to stop the infiltration of their ranks by those of lower birth, and for a while at least, the peasants had fate and numbers on their side. They, they revolted against these new restrictions and forced concessions by the ruling class, at least for a time. Still, the erosion of critical societal functions and the necessary services due to the plague caused reconsideration of the entire structure of society. The deficiencies in agricultural production could be made up in part by the fact that the population was significantly lower than it was pre-plague. As a result, less food was needed. The reduction in peasant labor appears to have also spurred human ingenuity to find labor-saving devices, such as the emergence of mills to grind grain and the printing press. In addition, the newly empowered and enterprising peasants may have appropriated for themselves the land of the masters who vacated their estates during the time of the plague. If the masters didn't return to contest it, the peasants would have had their own land. Instead of paying rent on a hovel, they had houses and an incentive to make a go of it by investing their labor and resources in its success. As a result of being more in control of their own destinies, the peasants ate better and became healthier as a group. In fact, there may have been a fairly profound transition among the peasant class from a largely grain-based diet to one that consisted of generous portions of meat. Modern biologists will tell you that such a dietary shift would have created children with bigger, more active brains. Best of all, these were the first steps in challenging the feudal system that had suppressed the growth and ambition of the peasant class for centuries. An intriguing possibility is that the plague, while it was unquestionably a terrible assault upon mankind, may have led, in a roundabout way, to liberation. Prior to the plague, everybody knew his or her place in society. There was great emphasis on piety, belief in God, and living one's life in a way that exemplified the virtues of Christ. In short, 
there was little questioning of the status quo or the set of beliefs that bound society together. After the plague, the human mind began to question everything. Why is God doing this to us? What purpose does this serve? Every person in medieval society had witnessed or knew someone who had died from the plague. Why are men of God not able to stop the scourge? Scholars found newfound liberation of the mind as a necessary predicate and perhaps a direct antecedent to intellectual and artistic flowering that took place during the period of time after the plague known as the Renaissance. The Renaissance began in the late 14th century and extended well into the 16th century. It marked the transition from the medieval world to the modern one. And the role of the plague in bringing about this fascinating shift in thinking stands out as an enduring monument to the human ability to adapt and overcome suffering that took place during the time of the plague. And here is your study guide for this module.